so uh, welcome everybody on behalf of uh, Francesco Pignatelli, the ELISA action leader, Lorena Hernandez, uh, project officer of Joint Research Center of European Commission and myself, Simon Vrechar, consultant at Joint Research Center of the European Commission, uh, who together will be co-hosting today this webinar uh, with the title Monitoring and Understanding Emerging Geospatial Technologies. Uh, maybe first uh, a few words about ELISA, as you can see on the next slide. So for, for those who don't know about ELISA, ELISA stands for European Location Interoperability Solution for e-government. And uh, this action is actually part of the ISA Square program, which is an European interoperability program uh, aiming at providing cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solution for public administrations businesses and citizens. So in, under this uh, uh, program, there are 54 different actions tackling interoperability from different angles. And ELISA is the only one amongst them focusing uh, on the location domain, uh, dimension as a driver for enabling the digital uh, government transformation. Uh, so on the next slide, we have uh, a bit to explain about the ELISA knowledge transfer activities. So under these activities, uh, we are uh, periodically uh, organizing webinars whose aim is actually to engage in some agile way uh, with topics of relevance to the digital transformation uh, by harnessing uh, the use of location data. And of course, uh, with the aim to share and present all the results that are actually produced under the uh, ELISA activities. So for more information about uh, our webinars, you are kindly asked to, to, to visit uh, our uh, join up uh, uh, web page. Uh, so uh, at this moment, I would just like to remind you on some uh, special webinars that we've prepared recently. Uh, so uh, dedicated to the location intelligence for regions and cities. So there is still left one part of this puzzle, which will be present on 14th of October during the European Weeks of Regions and Cities. Uh, we'll tell you a bit more about that at the end of this webinar today. So how to register and you're of course uh, welcome to be there with us as well. Uh, so, okay, so coming back uh, on the next slide, uh, Coming back to, to, to today's webinar, so uh, a lot is, has been talking about the new technologies and trends, uh, different kinds of big data, data analytics, blockchains, internet of things, uh, cloud, uh, fog, uh, edge, and so on. So location authentication and so on. So uh, all of these energies, uh, most of them, uh, most of these uh, um, uh, technologies uh, have certain impact uh, on our work, let's say. So that, that means on the, on the geospatial sector uh, in general. And on the other side, uh, the geospatial sector is also contributing to the developments uh, and, uh, of, of this technology and also to create different solutions that uh, uh, make uh, the use of these technologies. So today, as you can see on the next slide, uh, we have two speakers with us. Uh, Danny van der Broeke, uh, uh, senior researcher from KU Leuven, and Go Bechobona from uh, OGC Standards team, which uh, together with the uh, ELISA GRC team has the, have done uh, research for this webinar today. Uh, and uh, they will walk you through uh, different topics. So uh, to present you the key drivers, uh, general trends, uh, uh, how monitor and assess the uh, different technological trends. So the, they will give you an overview of the major trends. What are the interoperability challenges and efforts? And uh, how, what are the ways uh, that you can get acquainted with the new uh, technologies? But before we go to the content into the webinar, uh, I would invite you uh, to, 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 to do the polling. So to, to see a bit uh, where are you coming from? So what is your affiliation? And uh, what, uh, what is more, what are you ex actually expecting from this webinar? So the poll has been started. So can we ask to, to vote, please? So let's take, let's say 20 seconds for voting. So do we see the, what is the demography of the people today and what are your expectations? <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so let's end the polls. So it's, uh, it looks like that most of you are from the academia and research uh, and as well from the European public administration. So what would be your expectation? So you would like to get the overview of the major trends and how they fit together. I think these are the good inputs for Dani and to Gobe to start with the webinar. Please, Dani, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, then I go ahead. Uh, Oko, also welcome from my side. Uh, so I will start to kick off this, uh, uh, the content of this uh, webinar. Um, maybe I first go some key messages that we want to stress throughout uh, this webinar. Uh, first message is that we see a lot of technological trends uh, emerging. Others are already for some time there and are becoming mature. Uh, but we hear a lot from different people, different organizations, that it's often, often difficult to see the wood for the trees. So there are many emerging trends, there are many things happening. Uh, in order to monitor and understand these trends, uh, we know that they are interconnected. Uh, we think that there is the, a need for a comprehensive technology trends watch, so a more advanced system to really uh, understand, to monitor the interrelated trends. The third uh, message from this webinar will be that all these trends uh, uh, lead also to kind of revision of our traditional SDI architectures and the related standards. So these are evolving too. And this is uh, of particular importance for the ISS Square program that is uh, of course uh, focusing on interoperability issues. Um, so it's clear also the geospatial technology, the data management, handling and processing of geospatial data. Because of these trends, these uh, are uh, changing rapidly as well. So that are the key messages. And I will first dive in a little bit uh, on what are the major drivers uh, in the geospatial sector. Uh, and in fact, this uh, work is based on uh, one very important or a few very important uh, publications from UNGGIM uh, that has developed the Future Trends document. Already the third edition has been uh, released now in 2020. And uh, there is there uh, work done and an identification of five key drivers and uh, 31 related trends. So I want to focus a little bit in this section on the drivers. Uh, so it's not only about the technology, so that's quite important to understand. Uh, of course, we have uh, one of the drivers is the enormous amount of data and different new data sources. And related to that also, the way we handle and manage these data is shifting dramatically. Uh, while uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it was difficult to find the right information, the right data. Now there's an abundant uh, amount of data and sometimes it's very difficult to find the right information that we are looking for. So it's, that's changing dramatically the way we work, the way we live, the way we understand what is happening. Of course, the technological advancement themselves is another uh, key driver. There are, um, in all subsectors and sectors of society, there are technological advancements, they influence each other a lot, so, and that has an impact also on the geospatial sector. Uh, but the third is even maybe, in my opinion personally, one of the most important drivers is that there is a lot of user expectations. Uh, citizens, businesses, everyone in general in society is expecting a lot and uh, everyone is connected with each other. So there is a lot of expectations. We need instant access to everything, etc. cetera. Uh, together with that, there is also an industrial structural shift. So the way industry is working is uh, changing dramatically. Also the interchange, the interplay with public sector actors, with citizens, with other peers is uh, dramatically changing. And the last element is, of course, that all this is happening in a, a political, uh, institutional and a legal context. And the legal environment and requirements is also kind of driver. On the one hand, we want to share more and more everything open. But on the other hand, we want also to protect some of our uh, data and our information. Uh, so these are the five drivers. Uh, 
uh, identified by uh, UNGGM, so by the geospatial community, let's say. Um, and of course, there are particular things happening in, in society that has or that that have also impact on what is what is ongoing. Uh, of course, we have to keep track of all the political realities, what is ongoing, geopolitics uh, at large, so in the whole world. Of course, we have things like COVID-19 that has dramatic impact over only the last six to eight months already, and that will continue to have an impact. There might be other things similar to COVID. Uh, there are economic elements, population change and developments, uh, environmental pressure that we need to take into account in everything we do. And of course, the values in society of, of people, of organizations are also not uh, blocked and, and fixed. They are dynamic and evolving. Uh, against that backdrop, we know also that everything happens somewhere. And we can say that in with, for example, smartphones, uh, geospatial has entered the mainstream. Everyone is using Google Maps or any other device like a GPS in the car or whatever. Um, and everything is changing and more and more is more and more location enabled. And so the way we, as a, as a citizen, as a person, uh, consume services uh, also is changing. And uh, one of the highlights there is that it's not enough to have static information in a kind of infrastructure through maps on the web, but we need near real time information, dynamic information on events, etc., combined with other information. And uh, it is expected that in the next decades, uh, geospatial information become, will become even more important and influence uh, in general, the global economy. Uh, if we look into a few highlights on the different drivers then, um, so one, uh, if we speak about technological advancement and developments, we don't speak about one particular development, one, technology, but it's many developments. And as I said before, they are interrelated. Um, uh, the geospatial industry is driven more and more by automation, artificial, artificial intelligence, sensor uh, technology is a major part of the, of the industry now. And we make the link to internet of things. Uh, and there is abundant uh, data, uh, many data sources, uh, there are so many data that it's hardly and very difficult to manage everything. And mostly uh, the uh, biggest part of the data is coming from mobile data collections, crowdsourcing, social media. Uh, and that really is a, a kind of tsunami uh, of data and information. And that will have a very big impact on the next decades. Um, the other drivers that were mentioned is the industrial shift. Uh, we speak mainly about a lot of automation, uh, more and more intelligent uh, application using AI, uh, so that people in industry might be freed up and focus not anymore on repetitive uh, monitoring or collection of data tasks, but rather that machines will take over and that we can focus more on higher value tasks. As we said also, the user requirements are, are really a push factor, a driver, um, and that's this uh, real-time uh, data uh, on, and frictionless, so uh, it has to come when we need it, in the right time, at the right place, in the, uh, at the, for the right people. Um, so uh, usually we speak about the interconnection between different people, uh, we live in a network. Uh, but of course, there is the backdrop of the legal environment that we have to take into account and there we can refer and in the report of UNGGM, it is a reference made to the Cam Cambridge Analytica and Facebook data scandal uh, of 2018, uh, which of course uh, requires us also to look into ethics, into privacy issues and new regulations. Okay, that's the drivers. Uh, now. The second section, we will zoom in on the technological developments, the trends, uh, and we will have an overview uh, on uh, the different aspects related to that. But there is first uh, a few questions again. Yeah, 
yes, before going to this, uh, to this uh, section, uh, we would like to pose a few questions as well for you. So since we have a speaker from OGC as well, uh, are you following the OGC technological trends monitoring activities? This is the first question. And the second one is about the purpose you want to monitor technology trends. So please uh, take uh, a few more seconds for answers. <clears throat> Okay, so two thirds of you, you answered. So on the first questions, I heard about the OGC Trends Watch, but did not follow it actively. Uh, and the purpose of monitoring is actually, the most of you answered to, to plan modifications in our work processes, data production and decision-making. So, okay, please, Danny, continue with your presentation. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so we dive now a little bit deeper into different mechanisms that are in place, studies, etc., uh, for monitoring and assessing trends. So it's going from isolated studies to really technology trends watches. Uh, if we speak about monitoring trends, what do we speak about? That's the first question, of course. Uh, do we speak about disruptive technologies? What is a disruptive technology? Uh, you can dispute or discuss about that. Uh, because some of the trends are already there for a longer time. For example, uh, artificial intelligence was coined for the first time in a workshop of Dartmouth College in 56, so already some time. Uh, also, if you go online on the, on the web, you will see that some people, some organizations uh, uh, assess certain technologies as disruptive while maybe for geospatial uh, ecosystem and community, it's already old between brackets. Uh, the example is given by Smith and Scott, who refer to e-commerce and GPS systems as disruptive technologies, still stating that in 2020, while we say, okay, GPS is already for a longer time there. We all also see that various terms are used. So we speak about future trends, disruptive technologies, technological innovation. Uh, so in what we do, in fact, uh, we look at it in a broader context, not only disruptive technologies, but also the emerging trends and we monitor uh, their uh, development. Uh, why do we need monitoring trends? Why is that useful? Uh, there might be many reasons for doing that. Uh, some organizations want to monitor it because uh, discovering new markets or business opportunities. Uh, some say, okay, we need to integrate new technologies in our production process, so to increase efficiency and effectiveness, uh, or the performance of ICT systems particular, in particular. Uh, uh, others, they look more in technological trends to try to answer complex problems. And probably the list might be a lot longer. Uh, it's also clear that many, many people in the IT sector, in the geospatial sector and other related sectors, they follow uh, already technological trends in, in a certain way because they need to, they need to know what's happening, what's ongoing and what might be relevant for them. Uh, in the right part of the slide, you see some of the top 10 strategic tech trends uh, mentioned in the report of 2020 by Gartner, uh, where you see particular aspects or implementations of technologies like human augmentation, uh, artificial intelligence security, uh, not aut only autonomous vehicles, but all other autonomous things, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when we speak about the trends, uh, annually these studies are being made, this monitoring is done, uh, it's evolving. So it's, it's, uh, the focus is not necessary every year uh, the same. Uh, there are many uh, organizations, uh, very known organizations that um, have publications or annually or every two years or so, or at least regularly, uh, they focus on, let's say, individual studies. There are many very interesting ones from Deloitte, Gartner, PwC, other uh, similar companies. Um, and usually they cover many aspects. Uh, usually they're quite descriptive. They deliver the context. Why are these trends emerging? 
Uh, sometimes they focus on case studies, examples that dive deeper into particular aspects. In some cases, like for example, the hype cycle of Gardner, uh, the idea is to have kind of maturity assessment. Where are we in the curve of development of the trend and when it is applicable in a certain context or not? Um, uh, and of course, also uh, there are different views. Sometimes the view is for, for companies. In other cases, in other studies, uh, it's rather the governmental perspective. Uh, and as I said before, a lot of these studies are repeated sometimes annually. But uh, technology trends watches um, and, and studies exist uh, also in particular organizations. Uh, these are two examples of two organizations that are also very relevant in our sector. In the space sector, we have uh, companies like Airbus or the ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, that have their own, Airbus has its own um, uh, tech trends uh, watch to develop uh, new technologies that might be relevant for, of course, plane productions, but uh, airplane productions, but also for uh, the geospatial part. Uh, recently, ESA uh, developed or they uh, uh, sent out a call for tender to have also for position navigation and timing uh, sectors, PNT, uh, a specific uh, technology trends watch to see the particular changes and new trends that will affect those particular subsectors. Uh, so, uh, a lot of initiatives are ongoing and emerging uh, in different places of the world. But um, before going to the first example of OGC, uh, is still an interesting uh, a publication, which is called Persistent Forecasting of Disruptive Technology. Uh, that is a deep publication that provides uh, an overview of what is a methodology, what is a methodology, how should we monitor uh, or not uh, disruptive technologies. So uh, the book covers different aspects. Uh, it covers the need for persistent long-term forecasting, which is something different than just monitoring a technology trends. Uh, it's also focusing on the methodology, methodologies you can use, uh, also warning for some potential bias, uh, discussing potential attributes, what are the elements for forecasting systems, and also evaluating some of the existing forecast systems and software tools. So this is an interesting um, um, uh, publication that also has been used uh, by the OGC, for example, to set up its uh, uh, technology trends watch. And I think I will hand over now to Gobe for explaining more on the OGC case, uh, how they do it and why they do it. Okay, uh, thank you, Danny. Um, I take it you can hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, my name is Gobe Hobana. I work for the Open Geospatial Consortium, also known as the OGC. I'm part of the team that monitors technology trends. The team is led by George Percival, OGC's Chief Technology Officer. So why does the OGC track geospatial technology trends? Uh, a number of years ago, um, the OGC planning committee, which consists of the strategic and principal members of the OGC, uh, identified a need to address the evolution of technology and uh, markets uh, with regard to new standards, how new standards can help, um, well, how new standards uh, should be developed in order to um, leverage some of those emerging technolo uh, technologies. Uh, so OGC uh, uh, embarked on a technology trends uh, monitoring initiative, uh, which we refer to the OGC Tech Trends Initiative, uh, with the view of providing unique technology assessments that focus on the geospatial domain and assess the uh, implications and the impact of those technologies on geospatial technologies and standards. Uh, and we use those assessments to plan our internal R&D uh, activities which inform the standardization work that the uh, OGC uh, conducts. Next slide, please. Okay, so the 
Technology Trends Initiative within OGC is part of a broader set of activities that uh, run within the OGC. What you can see on the slide is the cycle that uh, effectively links together the Technology Trends Initiative to the Innovation Program, uh, which runs test bids, pilots, hackathons, sprints, and other activities and through to the standards program where you find the standards working groups that actually write the draft specifications and pass those specifications to the OGC membership for approval. So the insight that is gained from the Technology Trends Initiative informs the research and development that takes place in the innovation program. And the lessons identified in the innovation program uh, inform the work that the standards program uh, runs uh, within those uh, working groups. And that um, eventually leads to the development of the standards. Now we also have domain working groups in the standards program. Those domain working groups help set out the requirements and needs uh, that then inform the technology trends initiative. So we have this continuous cycle from technology trends right through to applied standards. Uh, next slide, please. And the way we assess those technology trends, we start off by looking at uh, the breadth of techno uh, technologies that are out there, technologies that are emerging right across industry, academia, government, and elsewhere. So we, we assess those technologies uh, that is assessing the breadth of the technologies to identify and prioritize those, uh, those trends. And that results in uh, the mind map that you can see on the bottom left hand um, side of the slide. We then move on to the next uh, stage in the process where we assess individual technologies and evaluate the clusters of, of trends. And that results in um, and some trends clusters that effectively uh, give us a view as to how some of those trends um, might evolve. Um, with many of the trends, it's the, the convergence that uh, ultimately leads to um, also what I'll refer to as just uh, a disruption or as to uh, that leads to a step change in how uh, technology is, uh, is applied in society. So, um, so in the, Second stage in that process, we evaluate the clusters of, of, of trends. And then finally, on the, in the third stage, what we do is to focus on a specific trend and then pull it into our standardization process. So we plan uh, test beds, we plan pilots, sprints, hackathons, and other standardization activities. And um, that's the point at which we are now pulling that technology trend um, through to eventually become part of a future standard. Uh, so that is the three uh, phase uh, uh, process that we go through from reviewing a breadth of technologies to identify and prioritize trends to assessing uh, and evaluating clusters of trends and right through to focusing on a specific trend and acting on, the, uh, on that particular trend to bring it into uh, a future OGC standard. Uh, next slide, please. And to, uh, and to assess the breadth of uh, technologies that are out there, we, uh, we conduct a very broad um, literature review. So we conduct uh, a review of literature from academia, government departments, uh, OGC members, uh, commercial, uh, organizations, companies of all uh, of all kinds, um, and those you know, and the literature includes peer-reviewed journals, um, magazines, um, OGC uh, reports, and other documents, uh, industry publications, you know, including uh, market sector um, uh, publications and magazines as well. But we also hold a series of activities through the course of the year. Uh, including, for instance, the Location Powers Summit, as well as um, the Future Directions Workshops, and, um, and also produce 
discussion papers and engineering reports. The location power uh, summits are held um, uh, about um, about twice a year or so. It, it, um, it depends on the topics that are uh, explored. Uh, but we also hold future directions workshops um, every quarter. Now, what you can see on the right hand side of the slide uh, is an overview of the topics and trends that were identified from a review that we conducted between November 2019 and May 2020. Uh, that review included 446 documents in, uh, in total. And what you can see there is a view as to um, which topics uh, came up, which trends uh, came up, um, and you know, basically the occurrence of uh, of, of those topics um, throughout the corpus itself. So that gives you a view of how we actually collect the information that we need to help us um, produce the analysis that we produce as part of this uh, initiative. Um, next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So in addition to the literature review, what we also do is to use a variety of tools uh, and we've also recently worked with a company called Big Knowledge to develop uh, the Geospatial Technology Explorer. So this is a, a, a tool that um, helps us to understand the uh, technology trends as well as the, the relationships between them. Um, to develop the Geospatial Technology Explorer, what we did was we, con um, we processed a corpus of more than 100,000 uh, document artifacts, and those documents included textbooks, standards, manuscripts, engineering reports, uh, um, research journals, and you know glossaries and so many other uh, documents. And we worked with Big Knowledge. They have a an, uh, natural language processing process that uh, processes um, that corpus and generates a relief map, and that is what you can see on. Uh, on the right hand side of this slide. The way the um, trends are presented on this relief map, the trends that are, um, the more the trends are closer together on the relief map, uh, the greater the number of uh, documents that uh, relate those trends together. So that immediately gives you a view as to uh, some of the convergence uh, that's identified in some of the research and other publications that are out there. What you can see on the left-hand side is the URL um, if you'd like to uh, try out the Geospatial Technology uh, Explorer. It's publicly ac uh, accessible. Uh, next slide, please. So all that analysis then enables us to identify the top level categories. And that's what you can see on this slide. So we have a number of top level categories which uh, help us to group the trends um, and to associate those trends, um, you know, within the context of, uh, of a single theme or a single category. Uh, the top level categories change basically about maybe once a year or so. Um, and the change is, uh, is gradual. So, you know, next year you, would, you don't expect to see a complete overhaul of the top level categories, but maybe two or three of them uh, might fall off the top level um, you know, uh, category list, and you might find uh, two, two or three additional uh, ones added there. Um, so these top level categories help us to group and analyze the, the trends um, that we uh, identify in, in that uh, uh, literature review, as well as uh, in all those uh, events that we hold, future directions, location powers, and others. Uh, next slide, please. And within each technology trend, there are a number of, sorry, within each top level category, there are a number of technology trends identified. And that's what you can see uh, on this slide. Now, one key point about um, these trends as well is that some of these trends um, are new in terms of um, their emergence and, um, and um, impact in the geospatial com community. Um, however, others um, have evolved uh, in recent times. So, you know, they might have been there for a while, but they have reached a certain point in their 
um, in their evolution, where they are making new impact and um, you know creating a, a step change in how they are applied. Uh, I'll give you some examples. For instance, there's the discrete global grid system. Uh, now that is a technology trend that. Uh, OGC has developed uh, uh, a standard for an abstract specification for, and we're currently working with ISO uh, to uh, publish the next version of that standard, which will become a, a joint OGC and ISO uh, standard. Um, but also we've got underground models, which is um, within the special, uh, special temporal uh, models uh, category. Now, underground models, uh, we recently established a standards working group that's going to be focusing squarely on underground data uh, models. Um, however, in addition to those trends that we've already brought into the standardization process, there are other trends that uh, are new to, um, you know, to, uh, to our community and trends that we are starting to um, you know, to discuss the requirements for. And an example of such trends is blockchain. Uh, we recently established a domain working group. Uh, we haven't established a standards working group yet, uh, but that domain working group will help us to understand that area more and to help highlight the uh, standardization requirements for that particular community. Um, another uh, area is artificial intelligence. Uh, as well as um, machine learning. So we have a domain working group. So with these technology trends, they help us to understand the, um, you know, the landscape. The analysis helps us to understand the lens landscape, and then we can react to that, um, you know, to that change in lens landscape by setting up standards working groups, domain working groups, and other activities to help us identify the standardization requirements and ultimately produce standards um, for uh, that particular uh, trend. Uh, next slide, please. And with many of those trends, they eventually, eventually uh, converge. Um, so in some cases, they'll converge to create another trend. Uh, in other cases, they'll converge to address a particular social need. Uh, an example of um, uh, uh, a number of trends that are uh, converging to address a social need uh, includes, for instance, location-based services, um, including Bluetooth and others that are converging to respond to COVID-19. Others include, for instance, geospatial data science, uh, which where we have, you know, just geospatial statistics, uh, machine learning, and AI approaches that are converging uh, to help us, uh, you know, take advantage and uh, apply data science uh, to areas that, uh, you know, where basically society has a, a need uh, for those, uh, those technologies. So uh, we, with a lot of these trends, we're seeing convergence and where multiple technology trends converge, typically that results in a new trend that uh, addresses a, a specific social need. So um, that's, um, I think that is the last slide that I had. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's uh, back to Danny. Yes, thank you, Goga. Um, the second example I will briefly uh, present is uh, the use of the monitoring of technology trends in the context of educational requirements. Uh, so EO4GEO is a sector skills alliance for the space and geospatial sector that tries to bridge the gap between the supply and demand for skills in the sector and in that way also improve the user uptake of Copernicus. Uh, in that context, uh, there is the development of a skills intelligence uh, exercise where uh, an assessment made, is made of the supply and demand, but also uh, new technological and non-technological societal trends are assessed and how they will influence our influences already, already the skills requirements in the sector. And then uh, this is used to develop a strategy to fill the gaps. And uh, also in practical terms, uh, new um, identified trends are feeding a body of knowledge 
uh, that is then used to do curriculum design, etc. So the schema on this slide is providing that a little bit. I will not go into the details what the body of knowledge is, but in short, it's uh, in this case, in our case, it's an ontology based body of knowledge describing, in fact, the professional domain, uh, all concepts, theories, technologies, uh, standards, whatever they are described in a body of knowledge. And so we use or want to use a technology trends watch to feed the body of knowledge, to evaluate also maturity in terms of when do we need and how do we need to provide education and training on the new topics, uh, how should we do that? And then the body of knowledge is also used to define research project, to design curricula, et cetera, et cetera. So it's in practical terms, an other way, like in OGC, it's more to steer the standardization process. In our case, it's a way to uh, steer, in fact, an educational process and uh, vocational and uh, academic training. Uh, very important is that in this body of knowledge, it's always difficult to make the exact match of what is our domain. Uh, we speak about GI and Earth observation, science and technology, but we know it's not only science and technology, it's also the applications, but there is also a link to many other uh, areas, scientific fields, etc. And so our body of knowledge is a little bit broader. And I think also in the way OGC is monitoring, monitoring technological trends, it's not in the narrow sense, but it's rather in the broader sense. And there are many links and hooks to ICT, to other uh, domains, of course, because geospatial is not uh, uh, occurring in isolation. So that's the second example. And I think there will be a new poll now, if I'm not wrong. Yes, indeed, Dennis. So before to continue to the next section, uh, we would like to ask you a bit about the which technological trends areas do you plan to experiment with or even might implement? So may it be data analytics, machine learning, digital twins, immersive visualization techniques like augmented reality, virtual reality, indoor models and positioning, APIs for the web, CESL's web and data streams, modeling advanced analysis and predictions method, cloud fault and edge computing. So yes, you are voting. Let's have maybe another 10 seconds for voting. Okay, again, two thirds. So obviously the most of you are for APIs for the web and for modeling advanced analysis and predictions methods. Okay, that's, uh, let's, let's see what Danny will share with us with major trends and how to fit together. Okay, uh, of course, in this uh, short webinar, it's impossible to discuss all the technological trends. Also, uh, it should be noticed that there are several other webinars of Elise that are focusing on digital twins, on geo APIs, uh, geo AI, et cetera. Uh, also on APIs, there is uh, uh, one or two uh, webinars uh, in the past, so they are still available. Uh, what I want to showcase here in this section is starting from this uh, branch, this map mind, uh, mind map of all kind of uh, technological trends is how you can use it in concrete cases. In our case, it's to do research or to prepare education, etc. And the first example I want to give briefly two examples. The first is uh, the use of what we call agent-based spatial modeling. Um, a very concrete case where uh, an assessment was made of behavior of children in traffic uh, with starting questions, uh, R&D questions like how do uh, children and smaller kids especially experience their environment when they go to school using the bike, for example. Uh, what do they see? What do they not see? What do they focus on? Uh, maybe this, you have different types of kids, uh, different typology, different type of, of behavior. Um, uh, so this was done uh, using different type of technological um, technologies. Uh, and was going back, of course, to basic elements such as spatial thinking, the spatial brain, uh, spatial experience, uh, um, um, how uh, youngsters conceive their environment and experience uh, uh, their environment, especially. 
uh, and that was related to how they behave in, in space, in, in their environment, in this case, in a traffic situation. So that's related to human active, activity modeling, or we call it also sometimes agent-based modeling. And for that, you need to have these digital, rich digital twins, not only with 3D city models of buildings, but you need also furniture, you need uh, uh, all the elements that are in the environment, physical elements and non-physical elements, but also, for example, the moving cars and the moving bikes and motorcycles, etc. And in this context, of course, you need more advanced visualization techniques, so, uh, such as uh, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality gaming. Gaming would be a, a good uh, solution also to train youngsters, for example, and that uh, was the idea also to have this output of this kind of uh, testing and experimenting as input for urban planning, for example, to re-engineer crossings, uh, to replace or improve the use of signals, uh, to reposition even trees in, in the context of a particular setting, etc. But also in the other way around, uh, using uh, or adapting teaching programs at school, taking these uh, experiences and these um, uh, conclusions or these, these results uh, into account. Of course, in this context also typical or specific technology as eye tracking technology, eyewear, advanced eyewear was used to, well, to in fact to understand how uh, youngsters were looking at their environment. The other example is uh, more on automatic object detection in the field of earth observation. Uh, where one specific call was to have a better insight in how refugees flows are happening, uh, especially at borders of the European Union, how we can automatically eventually discover vehicles and boats using huge amounts of images, because that's, of course, the challenge, the big data streams. Uh, of course, also uh, uh, boats and vehicles, they are moving, so it's not fixed. So you need a very complex and advanced uh, analytical mechanism and approach to find to say so the needle in the haystack by using in our case machine learning and deep learning um, and the results could be then uh, used to discover these flow patterns behavior of groups of people etc and the ultimate goal was of course to use that as an input for security policy etc but the technology trends used there were of course on big data huge volumes of data analytics uh, and performing data analytics uh, on bigger amounts of data, although this, the focus in reality was not much on that one, but rather on the algorithms to detect automatically certain objects. Uh, use of machine learning, uh, use of different types of satellite imagery, not only from Copernicus, but also others, but also human activity modeling was in there. Uh, and then in the long term, uh, the processing power uh, will need some new technologies such as, such as quantum computing. Of course, in this context, there was also a particular IT ethics that uh, was to be taken into account, although we did not really work on it. But this gives you an idea of flavor, how different technology trends can be used and combined in particular settings for particular R&D projects or educational projects or a mixture of uh, those. Um, I want now to zoom a little bit, and it's a short section as well, uh, on the effect or the impact or what is happening related to interoperability efforts to be made based on all these changes uh, we see. And I want also only to introduce it to give you a flavor. There is also in the reference list a lot of interesting literature uh, taken into account and available. Um, uh, first element to raise, of course, is that we probably with all these developments, these new technologies, and this is based on an article from Kotsev and other authors uh, from the GRC uh, that put the discussion on the table of uh, we are going from traditional SDI architectures uh, where we have the publish, search, find, bind paradigm uh, using portals towards a more mixed environment where uh, we need to work together at the data tier level, uh, of course, because uh, it's not only uh, only the typical uh, public authority mapping agency, et cetera, uh, type of data, but it's also data from uh, 
private sector, from private, from people, from citizens, citizen data, it's coming from all kinds of sensors, physical sensors, etc., etc. So the data there is already changing dramatically. And with the API developments, we know also that the way of service-oriented architecture is shifting more towards uh, other ways of providing access and providing the data uh, themselves. And also at the application tier, it should, it should support many, many different type of applications, um, whether it's, for example, at European level e-reporting, but it can be all, also other things at global level or even at local level. And of course, this is a, a big challenge in uh, the European interoperability framework. You have not only have the semantic in technological uh, or the technical interoperability, but also the organizational interoperability. And bringing together all these efforts requires also another way of uh, harmonizing or standardizing data. Uh, so we all are actor or we will become all actor in providing pieces of the solution in this type of infrastructure. And you see it already, what is happening in the standardization world alone is you don't have only ISO TC211 and OGC working on these issues, but more and more OGC and ISO are working in conjunction with other ISO committees, with OMG, with W3C, with IEEE, or with specific uh, standardization efforts or associations that are focusing on particular areas. I've just put here a few of them uh, where you can see already, and this is not complete because uh, it, it did not match on, on, on the slide, but you see that many uh, are involved. So also the standardization worlds are coming together and co-creation of standards in an agile way is a new paradigm or a new way of doing things. You can see this already in OGC work. Uh, uh, often when I speak with uh, people from public sector bodies or even academia, they say OGC, oh, that's WMS and WFS, that's what they know. Uh, but already for years, uh, it's working on different things, other things, indoor, smart cities, 3D, sensor web, moving feature, secure access challenges, the semantic web APIs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also the way the development is done and the, the standards are made is more interactive. Uh, for example, now with the APIs, with the API sprints, it's interesting to see. Another impact on the standardization will be, of course, on the way we look at semantic models. Um, myself, I was, and I'm a lot involved in the SPI development, but okay, still uh, traditional data models where we put everything in UML, nicely defined by the community. It remains, it's still relevant, but more and more we see that other approaches for uh, reaching semantic data uh, interoperability uh, is emerging like they do in the OpenStreetMap uh, um, initiative or in Darwin Core Archive on biodiversity. They do it also in different ways. So it will be smaller building blocks probably. And also we need to do it differently because others like citizens and public sector actors will be more and more involved. Um, and therefore, it's a kind of um, call to also have more collaborative experimenting. Also, the OGC is a good uh, example of doing that already uh, to a certain degree, but uh, we think that we should uh, expand this also in the way we work together uh, in harmonization efforts, etc. Whether that's a persistent test bed or a sandbox or a living lab or collaborative platforms, we see this emerging as a way of trying things, experimenting, working together, um, and that can take uh, many, many forms um, and uh, shapes. And with that, I think we will go, before going to do key takeaway messages to another poll, the last poll, I think. Yes, indeed. So in the last poll, we would like to ask you about the topics you want. Uh, the future release of webinars are focused more in the future. So uh, the topics that will uh, listed before, so were that uh, data analytics, digital twins, we had already digital twins, something, immersive visualization techniques, indoor models, APIs for the web, sensor web and event data streams, modeling, cloud fund and edge computing. So please take a few seconds for vote so that we 
see a bit in which directions we will prepare our future webinars. Okay, thank you for voting. So uh, obviously most wanted is let's say modeling advanced analysis and prediction methods and APIs for the web. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. So please, Benny, continue. Okay, only two slides uh, left, some conclusions or concluding remarks. Um, so it's clear that technology trends, geospatial technology, uh, technology trends are influenced by many different factors and not only the technology per se, but also economical, legal and political drivers are there. Uh, we need really a consistent way of doing technology trends a monitoring system. We need that uh, so that we can really analyze emerging technology, how they are interconnected, how they might be applied to different contexts. Um, since they change very rapidly, uh, we should not also wait too long maybe in different organizations to try to try them out, to experiment. So that's one of uh, for me, one of the conclusions or one of uh, the recommendations we could give uh, different, using different types of uh, experimenting environments. Um, it's also clear that we have many stakeholders involved in the geospatial community that we should work together for having a good, strong technology trends watch as in a real system that we can all use and reuse. Um, it's also key for us that we could link this technology trends watch to systematically assess new skills requirements. And finally, um, okay, we don't know exactly the full impact of all these major technology trends. It's maybe not entirely clear on interoperability and that requires certainly uh, future investigation. And with that, I think I want to conclude and uh, go to the question and answer. Yes, thank you very much, Danny. Thank you very much, Gobe, for your very interesting presentation today. I think we've heard quite a lot of different things. Uh, new technologies, trends uh, that uh, are affecting geospatial sectors, geospatial technologies, geospatial trends. Uh, they're interrelated between each other. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, uh, so maybe I will ask a question for both of you, Danny and Kobe. Uh, so seeing all that today, so in the past, um, uh, there was a saying that the spatial is special. Uh, so hearing all this today, so how, what, what is your perspective on, on that statement today? So it's, it's spatial, it's still special? Kobe, can you start? All right, uh, yeah, so um, location. Um, so location data and location information um, is now mainstream. Um, so I'm, I'm intentionally avoiding using the word special there, uh, but I want to highlight that uh, location data is now mainstream. We have um, developers and end users from across society using location to address challenges uh, that you know, previously uh, could not be uh, um, uh, addressed uh, through uh, spatial data. So, um, so I think from my perspective, um, spatial is, is mainstream. Um, it's, um, it's gone beyond just being a, a, a niche market uh, and it's made it into uh, you know, into homes and to um, parts of society where it, it wasn't uh, there before. Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, Gober. Uh, what I, I still want to stress is that th there is still a, a need, I think, for example, uh, at uh, secondary school level to put location more in the forefront. We know all that uh, um, Geography, for, exa for example, is not very prominent in, in classes in schools, but location, location thinking, spatial thinking 
is something that everyone and every youngster and every citizen should be able to do. And I think that will, in that sense, it will be even become more mainstream that it is drilling down, not only before it was for experts, then uh, everyone gets started uh, using as an adult, the GPS or whatever, or Google Maps or Google Earth or other things. But I think it should be everywhere in, in society. And, and that will come definitely also with the new technological trends, uh, which will uh, make it more easy and uh, uh, to have location information integrated in, in regular applications, for example, for tourism, for all kinds of things in, in traffic management, in, in the way we also live and, and, and behave with, with each other. Even COVID-19 has uh, stressed the, the importance of location, distance, uh, spatial clustering. Now people know what these things mean. <laughs> Uh, maybe unfortunately, but it's the case. Okay, thank you very much. So, as uh, as understand, uh, uh, transforming from geospatial from vertical to horizontal, it became from special to mainstream actually, which is uh, still more important. Uh, there are some other comments I think in the chat for Knut. Knut, would you like to say something? Knut from ISO. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to add for, for this slide on uh, the different words coming together, which was a very interesting slide, that uh, we could also note that uh, ISO TC211 is uh, working closely together with uh, TC59 on BIM standardization yeah. and with uh, TC204 on ITS standardization uh of geospatial information so there is a we have joint working groups with uh with those two other um, technical committees so um yeah like yeah. Uh, for instance uh, a future version of the gdf standard for uh, its uh, will probably be based on the same principles as uh, iso 211 and ogc standards mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be interesting because when I was preparing this slide, I was um, realizing that there is a lot more <laughs> and that it would be interesting to, to map all these interconnections and uh, joint initiatives ongoing uh, because I, I'm sure I forgot many and there are, as you say, uh, in different sub areas, there are a lot of initiatives, which is kind of good thing, I think, uh, and, and that's uh, happening more and more. So, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for these comments, uh, Danny, Gobe and Knut. I think there are no further questions. So please, uh, before I conclude, uh, I would like to invite you somewhere else, as I mentioned in the beginning. So please, the next slide, Danny. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, so um, uh, at 14th of October, we will be present at the European Week of Regions and Cities with a participatory lab, uh, Location Intelligence for Cities and Regions, where we will prepare this participatory lab uh, discussing location intelligence, innovation uh, through the eyes of the energies, efficiency and data ecosystems and how this can be supported by cities and regions. So you are kindly, kindly uh, uh, welcome to register. So you have this uh, register link and you will also uh, receive further information about that event uh, in, uh, in the communication with, uh, with the slides of this, uh, of this session. Okay, so uh, before to conclude, I would like to thank you, uh, everybody, for for attention and for participation today. Thank you, Danny and Gobe, for a very nice presentation. Thank you for all the comments. And as you can see on the next slide, uh, please follow us on all the all the uh, social media channels and join the Elisa community in Join Up as well, so that you will be able to follow, uh, uh, let's say, all the news from Elisa. Thank you very much, and bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.